Shalom, Salam und herzlich willkommen in Israel. Vor genau 70 Jahren wurde hier in Tel Aviv der Staat Israel gegründet. Offiziell wird gefeiert, doch das Heilige Land ist zutiefst gespalten. Israeli und Palästinenser, beide wollen ihr Land zurück und die Fronten sind verhärtet. Doch ich habe gleich die Gelegenheit, mit jemandem zu sprechen, der nach wie vor an eine Lösung glaubt. Mit Amos Oz, dem bedeutendsten Schriftsteller Israels. Ich befinde mich nun hier in Ramla, in einer Stadt an der alten Handelsstraße, die damals Kairo mit Damaskus verbunden hat, mitten in einem gespaltenen Land. Und ich möchte wissen, was macht dieser Konflikt mit den Menschen, die hier leben? Wo liegen die Wurzeln des Fanatismus? Und besteht überhaupt noch Hoffnung auf einen Kompromiss? Über diese Fragen spreche ich mit dem mehrfach preisgekrönten israelischen Schriftsteller Amos Oz, der dieses Land und seine Geschichte kennt wie kaum ein anderer und eine wichtige Stimme ist in der hiesigen Friedensbewegung. Herzlich willkommen, Herr Oz. Thank you. Ja, 70 Jahre Staatsgründung Israel, ist das für Sie ein Grund zu feiern? Well, yes, it is, because I'm old enough to remember what existed here before Israel. And it was no paradise. What existed here before Israel was no paradise, neither for Palestinian Arabs nor for the Jews. It was a torn, divided, conflicted land. This is not resolved now, but at least there is a certain horizon which had not existed for my people, for the Jewish people, for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Sie sagen, es gab einen bestimmten Fortschritt, aber das Paradies ist es immer noch nicht. Es gibt immer noch diesen Konflikt zwischen Israel und Palästina. Wenn Sie einem Kind erklären müssten, warum sich Israeli und Palästinenser seit Jahrzehnten heftig bekämpfen und bekriegen, was würden Sie dem Kind sagen? I will say this is a very, very small country, about the size of Denmark, but it's the only homeland of the Palestinian Arabs, and it is the only homeland of the Israeli Jews. The Palestinian Arabs have no other country which, as a people, they can call home. And the same about the Israeli Jews. They don't have any other country which, as a people, they can call home. Now, I believe that there is no perspective of immediate unification between Palestinians and Israelis. It's not realistic to expect two communities immersed in bloodshed, anger, hatred, violence, to just suddenly jump into a honeymoon bed together after 100 years and start making love, not war. This is just not working this way. What we need is to divide this small land into two even smaller apartments. One for the Israelis, one for the Palestinians, in peace, coexistence and no violence. Mm -hmm. Sie plädieren sehr stark seit dem Sechstagekrieg 67 eigentlich für diese zwei Staaten Lösung. Mm -hmm. Ich frage mich, ist das überhaupt noch realistisch und realisierbar? Weil wenn man auf die Landkarte von Israel guckt, sieht das aus wie ein Flickenteppich im Westjordanland. Ist das wirklich überhaupt realisierbar? Ideally, I'm not in favor of a two-state solution, not in favor of a one-state solution. I'm in favor of a world with no national states at all. But by the time we get there, every people needs a place where they can call home and feel at home. Yes, it is realizable, complicated, but realizable. Because in this country, there are very distinct areas which are predominantly Palestinian Arabs, other areas which are predominantly Israeli Jewish, and there are some mixed areas. What we need is to draw a line. There will be Palestinian Arabs in the future state of Israel. There will probably be some Israeli Jews in the future state of Palestine, but each one of those peoples need an apartment, a place which they can call 
their home and not be treated as a minority. You know, es ist interessant, Sie sagen, das muss der nächste Schritt sein, aber das Ziel wird ein anderes sein, ein Zusammenleben miteinander hoffentlich, aber erst muss man die beiden äh, trennen. Sie haben eine un unglaubliche Lebenserfahrung und sind eigentlich älter als dieses Land. Also Sie haben ja die Gründung des Landes miterlebt, yes. waren yes. damals neun yes. Jahre alt, ähm, sind äh, ein Kind von Einwanderern aus der Ukraine, jüdischen Einwanderern. Und ich habe mich gefragt, wenn Menschen älter werden, dann werden sie entweder weiser und reifer oder sie werden engstirniger, kompromissloser. Wie ist denn das mit Staaten und insbesondere mit dem Staat Israel? Well, I cannot generalize because Israelis differ, just like Palestinians differ. There are moderates, extremists, fanatics everywhere. And unfortunately, in recent years, fanaticism is growing among Israelis. It is growing among Palestinians and other Muslims. It is growing in the Christian world. It is growing in Europe. There is a, a, a universal rise of fanaticism. But I see no alternative to a compromise between Israel and Palestine, simply because no one of the parties is going to disappear. No one of the parties is going to walk away from here. They cannot become a happy couple, they have to become neighbors. Mm -hmm. Um diesen Konflikt noch besser zu verstehen, schauen wir jetzt zurück in die Vergangenheit vor der Staatsgründung in die Zeit des Osmanischen Reiches. Früher gab es hier keine Grenzen. Fast 500 Jahre lang war die arabische Halbinsel Teil des Osmanischen Reiches. Als sich während des Ersten Weltkrieges dessen Ende abzeichnete, traten die späteren europäischen Siegermächte auf den Plan und teilten den Nahen Osten unter sich auf. Frankreich bekäme den Südosten Anatoliens sowie den größten Teil des heutigen Syriens und den Libanon. Südlich davon erhielte Großbritannien sämtliche Gebiete zwischen dem Mittelmeer und dem Persischen Golf, Palästina, Jordanien und Irak. Zusätzlich sicherte der britische Außenminister Arthur James Balfour den Zionisten die Errichtung einer nationalen Heimstätte für das jüdische Volk in Palästina zu. Ein Land also, das bereits bewohnt war. Von Palästinensern, Muslimen wie Christen und von zionistischen Siedlern, die ab den 1870er Jahren einwanderten. Viele weitere sollten folgen. Die grauenhaften apokalyptischen Verbrechen an den europäischen Juden, verübt durch den deutschen Nationalsozialismus, führten zu einem Anstieg der jüdischen Einwanderung, obschon die britische Regierung das zu verhindern suchte. Auch die Palästinenser versuchten das zu verhindern. Sie kämpften gegen die neuen Siedler aus Europa und gegen die Briten. Und die zionistischen Truppen Haganah und Irgun gegen beide. 1947 überließ Großbritannien das Schicksal seines Mandatsgebiets der UNO. Mit Unterstützung der USA und der Sowjetunion beschloss diese, das Gebiet aufzuteilen und einen jüdischen und einen arabischen Staat zu schaffen. Dieser Teilungsplan wurde von der UNO-Vollversammlung angenommen, jedoch von sämtlichen arabischen Staaten abgelehnt. Sie monierten, der Plan würde das Selbstbestimmungsrecht der Völker missachten, denn zu jener Zeit waren die Palästinenser noch immer in der Mehrheit und wehrten sich nun immer heftiger. Die jüdischen Truppen schlugen zurück und griffen arabische Dörfer an. Die ersten Palästinenser flohen. Mitten im Bürgerkrieg, am 14. Mai 1948, rief David Ben-Gurion im Namen des provisorischen Volksrats schließlich die Unabhängigkeit des jüdischen Staates aus. Als Name wählte man Israel. Ja, Israel sollte es also heißen, dieses Land ähm, mit Referenz auf das Alte Testament, auf, den, auf Jakob, der so genannt wurde. Warum dieser Bezug auf das Alte Testament und welche Verpflichtung ist damit äh, verbunden? Well, my relation to the Old Testament is not a religious relation. I'm not a religious person. I'm an a-religious person. But historically. I realize that the Jewish people, as a people, 
never had any other homeland. As individuals, sometimes yes. As a people, no. Now, in a world of self-determination, it's only fair that the Jewish people will have the right to be the majority even in a very small piece of land, not an eternal minority. Sometimes well-treated minority, sometimes persecuted minority, but always a minority. I think the Jews have a right to be a majority in a small patch of land. And the only land where they ever have been a majority, the only land which they ever call homeland is this country. I realize that this country is not empty and that my parents, when they were kicked out of Europe in the 1930s and when they came here, they have not arrived into an empty country. The Palestinians were here and they had the right to be here and they had the right to claim this land as their homeland. But there is space enough. Es ist interessant, wirklich, wenn man in die Geschichte der Juden anschaut, ist es ist eine Geschichte von Vertreibung, der Diaspora. Und insofern ging 47, 48 richtig ein Traum, ein zionistischer Traum in Erfüllung. Aber Sie sagen, wenn Träume in Erfüllung gehen, ist das oft enttäuschend. Warum ist das so? Well, it is the nature of dreams. It is not the nature of Zionism or the nature of some erotic fantasy or the nature about, of a fantasy about traveling to an exotic country. Every fulfillment is never as wonderful as the original dream. This is universally true of any dream. Even when you planned or dreamt about this interview, you probably dreamt about something ideal. It's not going to be <laughs> ideal. I hope it's going to be good, but not ideal. Now, Israel is a dream come true, and as such, it could not live up to the supreme expectations of the founding fathers and mothers. Couldn't. There is no way for a dream to be fully fulfilled. Not in, in literature, and not in everyday life, and not in material life, and not in sex. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it is, I mean, für viele ist das das heilige Land oder das, das äh, versprochene Land, das von Gott versprochene Land. Welche Rolle spielt denn die Religion in dem ganzen Konflikt aus Ihrer Sicht? Oh, it's, it's playing a growing role and I'm not very happy about it. Because essentially, I don't see a reason for a religious conflict between Jew and Muslim, Jew and Christian, Muslim and Christian. I think different people may believe in different things. They may even treat the same land or the same city as a holy place for different reasons. And everyone can worship their way and pray their ways. There is no need to uh, 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 substantiate a religious faith by waving a flag. This idea, which was first experimented by the jihadists and then by the crusaders, I never believed that in order to make a holy place holy, you have to wave your flag over it. But this is not a religious conflict. This is a real estate conflict, basically. The Palestinians claim that this is their land and they are right. The Israeli Jews claim that this is their land and they are also right. And the solution is compromise. And I'm a great believer in compromise. Aber es ist doch das von Gott versprochene Land für einige gläubige Menschen. Deswegen spielt doch die Religion eine zentrale Rolle, würde man denken. You know, when religious people come to me, whether they are Jewish or Muslim, and they say, God promised this country to us, my simple answer is, God promised, let God fulfill his promise. It's not your business. Yeah to fulfill God's promise. Sit humbly and wait for God to carry out his promises. Mm. If I were a religious person, I would say it's not up to me. Mm. He takes, he gives. I happen not to be a religious person. I happen to believe in the need of different people, different faiths, different backgrounds to coexist through painful compromises. Compromise, if you wish, is my religion. Darüber werden wir noch sprechen. Darüber werden wir noch sprechen und auch über die Fanatiker, denen Sie ja Ihr neues Buch gewidmet haben. Ähm, Sie sagen an äh, einer Stelle, es gibt zwei Arten von Menschen. Die einen suchen nach Lösungen und nach immer neuen Lösungen 
und die anderen suchen nach Erlösung. Ähm, ich nehme an, Sie sind ein Mensch der ersten Sorte, der nach immer neuen Lösungen sucht. Aber seit wann ist das so? Gab es bei Ihnen, waren Sie mal auf der Suche nach Erlösung und ähm, wurden Sie enttäuscht? Oder wie, warum, wann kam das? Oh, well, when I was a little boy, I was fanatic, same as every other young Israeli, more or less, because I believed in a black and white world, good guys, bad guys. And for little me, when I was seven or eight year old, we were the good guys and our opponents were the bad guys. We were right, they were wrong. We were just, they were aggressive and, and bloodthirsty. It took me some personal experiences to realize that in some conflicts, in some conflicts, this is not simply a matter of black and white. Not every conflict in the world is Hollywood with good guys and bad guys. Some conflicts, like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, are tragedies in the Greek sense of the word tragedy, meaning a clash between right and right. Sometimes it's becoming a clash between wrong and wrong. But the story of Israel and Palestine is not a black and white story. It is not like apartheid. It is not like colonialism. It's, it is not like Nazism or fascism. It is a tragic clash between two very powerful, very convincing, very genuine claims over the same land. This is painful and it can only be resolved by compromise or by fighting it out to the death. And I prefer a compromise. Mm -hmm. In Ihrem neuen Buch über Fanatismus schreiben Sie, es sei eine ansteckende Krankheit, der Fanatismus. Und Fanatiker seien wandelnde Ausrufezeichen, weil sie immer glaubten, sie hätten Recht. Wo liegen für Sie denn die Wurzeln dieses Phänomens, die Wurzeln des Fanatismus? Well, I'm afraid the sources are not out there. They are inside almost every one of us. I think fanaticism is a bad gene in almost every human being. And very often fanaticism is manifested in the urge to change other people for their own good. You know better than your spouse or better than your child or better than your sibling or better than your neighbor what's good for her, what's good for him, you start telling them that they have to change. This is very nice. You may tell them. But if you go beyond telling them that they have to change, if you go into twisting their arms so that they change the way you think they have to change, then you are a fanatic. If you say to them, either you change or I kill you, then you are a fanatic. And the world is full of people who are militant about the urge to change other people for their own good, but to change them your way. Das ist wirklich interessant, weil Sie sagen, die Absicht dahinter ist eine gute. Man möchte eigentlich die Welt vom Bösen befreien. Das fand ich interessant. Und einen zweiten Punkt fand ich auch spannend, dass Sie sagen, hinter diesem Fanatismus steckt oft ein kindlicher, infantiler Wunsch, nach Verschmelzung mm -hmm. mit mm -hmm. etwas, das größer ist als ich, mit, mit einer Nation, vielleicht mit mm -hmm. einer Idee. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, in the first place, there is this infantile urge that everyone will be the same. The others have to open their eyes and ears, they have to change and be like me, and then everything will be all right, because I'm perfect and they are not. Moreover, the fanatic is very often a great altruist. He's not interested in himself, he's interested in you, he wants to save your soul. If you prove to be irredeemable, it's impossible to save your soul, he will strangle you for your own good. But he's always interested in you. Now this is a very dangerous syndrome because he's not interested in you as you are. He is interested in what is good for you and he knows better than you are what is good for you. If you are a smoker, he will try to make you a non-smoker, one way or another. If you vote this way, you will have to vote another way. You believe in this God, he will open your eyes to see the real God, and if not, crusade, jihad, inquisition, persecution. Mm -hmm. Welche Rolle spielt denn ähm, die Angst oder die Wut, solche Gefühle für, für Fanatismus in Ihren Augen? Well, fear and anger are the fuel. Very often, 
we fight someone or something because we don't know it and we don't want to know it, we are afraid of it. We are not only afraid of what it might do to us, we are afraid to be influenced. We are afra afraid that confronting the others may change our habits or our perspectives. And we are not easy to change our perspectives. We like our perspectives. Mm -hmm. We like our way of thinking. But I believe there are certain antidotes to fanaticism. One of them is sense of humor. I have never seen a fanatic with a sense of humor. <laughs> I've never seen a per sense, person with a sense of humor becoming a fanatic. Sense of humor is the ability to laugh at yourself sometimes. The ability to see yourself the way others see you. This is very important. Not for reasons of Jesus Christ, turn the other cheek, put yourself like a, like a rug under the feet of the other, no. Just the need to realize that there is more than just one point of view, more than just one perspective. And in some cases, both per perspectives may be valid even if they are contradicting each other, like the Israelis and the Palestinians. Könnte man jetzt sagen, wenn der Humor und diese Perspektivenübernahme so eine wichtige Rolle spielt, könnte man doch Pillen herstellen und diesen Fanatikern endlich ihren Fanatismus austreiben, indem man eine Humorpille in, ins Wasser mischt zum Beispiel. Dann wäre das Übel der Welt der Fanatismus. <lacht> yes, sometimes I think that if I could compress sense of humor into capsules, and make the entire population swallow my humor capsules and immune the world to fanaticism, I will deserve a Nobel Prize in medicine, not in literature. But then I say, wait a moment, sir. What are you trying to do? Make other people swallow your humor capsules for their own good? You want to change them? You want to make them like yourself? So you may catch it while fighting against it. Fanaticism is very contaminating. Yeah. I have seen anti-fanatic fanatics. Ein Punkt, wo Sie auch sagen, ähm, wir haben jetzt vieles angesprochen, äh, was sozusagen die Wurzeln des Fanatismus betrifft. Und eine Sache ist die fehlende Vorstellungskraft. Und da gibt es in Ihrem neuen Essayband eine wunderschöne Stelle, wo Sie schreiben, jemand kann sich vorstellen, ein ganzes Volk zu töten, aber er kann sich nicht vorstellen, ein kleines Kind ganz konkret zu töten, das krank zu Hause im Bett liegt. Yes. Yes. Look, it is much easier to shake your fist in the air and scream, those people must be destroyed. But sometimes, if you have to uh, visualize it, if you have to actually imagine yourself strangling a, a five-year-old girl, it's suddenly becoming very difficult. Easier to say they must be destroyed, they are the scam of the earth, they are a threat, they are a problem, than to look at them individually. This is where I'm a great believer in curiosity. This is where I'm a great believer in curiosity as yet another antidote to fanaticism. I think a curious person is a person who asks herself or himself sometimes the simple question, what if I were here? What if I were him? What if I, Amos Oz from Israel, would have been a Palestinian young man? I ask myself this question, it's not because I want to identify completely with my opponent or my enemy, no. I just want to see the complexity of the situation. And I believe that people who can imagine the other, people who are cur curious enough to imagine the other, they will be better spouses, better parents, and if this interview is presented late enough in the evening, I will tell you that curious people are even better lovers than people who are not curious. <lacht> also diese Neugier, die, die ist eigentlich auch das tägliche Brot eines Schriftstellers, wie, wie Sie es sind. Also diese Kunst in die Schuhe eines anderen zu schlüpfen. Spielt da die Literatur für Sie auch eine ganz zentrale Rolle in diesem Verständigungsprozess zwischen verschiedenen Parteien, vielleicht auch für den Frieden? Well, you know, to say that it's playing a central role would be an understatement. This is my life. Even when I'm not sitting and writing, I watch people, I spy on strangers. I try to find out what might be their stories. 
You know, literature and gossip are cousins. They are very similar. They both originate from curiosity, but there is a difference. Gossip is the urge to look into the window of the neighbor, see what's going on there. Literature gives you something better than that. It gives you the, the chance to see the world through the window of the neighbor. It even gives you the chance to stand in the neighbor's window and look at yourself the way you look from the neighbor's window. This, I think, is a wonderful present which literature can give you, art can give you, mm -hmm. curiosity can give you. Mm -hmm. Man lernt nicht nur die anderen besser kennen, sondern auch sich selbst, indem man sich selbst durch die Augen des anderen betrachtet, nehme ich an. Mm -hmm. Sie haben das Wort Kompromiss erwähnt und Sie glauben an die Kraft des äh, Kompromisses, auch an die Schönheit eines Kompromisses. Aber für viele Menschen, gerade für Fanatiker und für Fanatikerinnen, ist ein Kompromiss immer ein Zeichen von Schwäche. Yes. Wie, wie können wir das, diese Sichtweise ändern? Dass man sagt eben, Israeli und Palästinenser, da, da, da steht Recht gegen Recht, sagen Sie, oder Gerechtigkeit gegen Gerechtigkeit, es braucht einen Kompromiss. Wie ver vermittelt man die Schönheit eines Kompromisses? Mm -hmm. You know, not only the fanatics, many young idealists believe that compromise is ugly. Compromise is not honest, it's a lack of integrity. In my vocabulary, the word compromise is synonymous with the word life. The opposite of compromise is not idealism and devotion. The opposite of compromise is fanaticism and death. So to convey the beauty of compromise, you only have to tell people that life is made of compromises. Only death is uncompromising. It's final, it's absolute. Death is a fanatic, it's a walking exclamation mark. No arguments, no points of view, it's just death. But life is full of compromises. Gibt es für Sie einen höheren Wert als das Leben? Gibt es etwas, wofür Sie Ihr Leben opfern würden? Yes, if anyone wants to turn me into a slave, I will fight. I am not a pacifist in, in, in sentimentalist terms, namely turn the other cheek, come what might. Someone will try to kill the next person in the street or to rape the, the next person in the street, I'll pick up the arm and fight. And I did that twice in my life. I'm very sorry about it, but I'm not ashamed of it. I will do the same if your life would be in immediate danger the next minute and I could save you by fighting, I will fight. And I will fight if someone tries to turn me into a slave, but nothing else. I will not fight for so-called national interest or holy places. I will not fight for an extra bedroom for my nation. No, only for my life, for the life of the next person and for my freedom, nothing else. Mm -hmm. Und das sagen Sie, haben Sie getan. Sie haben wirklich in zwei Kriegen mitgekämpft, im yes. Sechstagekrieg ähm, 67 und im Yom Kippur-Krieg, dann auf den Golanhöhen 73. Was hat das mit Ihnen gemacht? Was ist das für eine Erfahrung, im Krieg mm -hmm. zu sein? Probably the worst experience I ever had in my life. And I don't think I can sum it up in a few words on a television interview. It's too hard to explain to someone who had not been on the battlefield how dreadful the battlefield is. But as I said, if I had to stop aggression by force, I'll stop it by force. The difference between peace activists like myself and a principal pacifist like many Europeans is that for a pacifist, the ultimate evil is war, violence. To me, no. To me, the ultimate evil is aggression. And sometimes aggression must be stopped by force. Violence is a result of aggression. War is a result of aggression. Aggression is the mother of all wars, to quote Saddam Hussein. So, to me, the nasty, Rival of my life is not the battlefield, it's the aggression. Haben Sie getötet im Krieg? You know, today's war is not being fought with knives. 
I don't know. I cannot answer this question because I'm not sure. I haven't killed anyone short range. But have, have I inflicted, my weapons inflicted injury or death on others? I have no way of telling. Ihr Leben ähm, ist sehr reich an, an Erlebnissen, auch an Schicksalsschlägen. Ähm, nicht nur diese beiden Kriege. Sie haben auch in der Jugend ein einschneidiges Erlebnis gehabt. Sie haben nämlich Ihre Mutter verloren, als Sie zwölf waren. Mhm. Mhm. Sie hat sich das Leben genommen. Was macht das mit einem Jungen, der zwölf Jahre alt ist? Well, I experienced a period of immense despair because I thought if my mother killed herself, it means she didn't love me. If she would have loved me, she would have stayed. If she didn't love me, no one will ever love me. If even my mother couldn't love me, I'm not worthy of anyone's love. So I hated her for killing herself, as if she ran off with a lover. I hated my father because in a vague way I thought there must be something terrible about him. I didn't know what, but I assumed that if his wife killed herself, there must be something terrible about him. And more than anything, I hated myself because I thought if I was a good little boy, my mother would have loved me and would have stayed. It took me a very long time to recover. It took me a very long time to remove anger loneliness and despair and replace them with curiosity, compassion, empathy and humor. When I finally came to write about my family in a book called The Tale of Love and Darkness, you will not find one ounce of bitterness or anger or hatred. You will find compassion, humor, curiosity and empathy. And I wrote this book trying to erase the line between comedy and tragedy. Comedy and tragedy are not two different planets. They are just two different windows through which we can see the same landscape of our lives. Das heißt, es ist der Blick, der sich verändert hat dann nach dem Suizid der Mutter. Und das ist eigentlich ihre wunderschön geschriebene Lebensgeschichte, wo genau diese humorvolle Melancholie spürbar ist in jeder Zeile. Und Sie beschreiben hier drin auch, dass Sie dann mit 15 Jahren weggegangen sind von zu Hause in einen Kibbutz, äh, in eine ländliche Kommune. Und ähm, da interessiert mich, wa was haben Sie da gesucht und, und was haben Sie gelernt über die Welt und den Menschen? Well, I rebelled against my father. I left home because I wanted to become everything he was not, and I did not want to be anything he was. <laughs> he was a right-wing intellectual um, a, a writer, and I decided to become a left-wing social democrat tractor driver. <laughs> he was a short man. I decided to become very tall. It didn't work for me. Uh, so I wanted to be the opposite of what he was. But then I lived 30 years on this commune called Kibbutz. And among many other things, this has been, for me, the best university for human nature. In those years on a Kibbutz, which is a little bit like an extended family, mm -hmm. no secrets, almost no secrets. Everybody knows almost everything about everyone. Darf ich fragen, wie groß diese Gruppe war? Yeah. About 400 people, men, women and children, small village. But no secrets. I knew all about them, including the most intimate gossip. The penalty was that they knew about me a lot more than I wanted them to know about me, but this was a fair deal. And for a writer, this is a wonderful preparation, a wonderful education. I have seen people in the best times and worst time. I saw the way they want to be conceived and the way they don't want to be conceived. I knew them inside out. And I'm very grateful to those years of kibbutz experience for turning me into the writer that I am. Also, es hat sich stark geprägt, stark verändert. Ähm, aber ich habe auch gelesen, dass Sie auch enttäuscht waren, weil das soll ja ein Übungsfeld sein für die Erneuerung, um ein neuer Mensch zu werden und eine neue Art des Zusammenlebens. Aber man ist auch gescheitert, sagen Sie. Yes, the big failure was that those 
fun funding fathers and mothers, they were naive, almost childish, in assuming that they can change, revolutionize human nature in one generation by changing the circumstances. I still believe in changing society. I still believe in social democratic ideals, but I no longer believe in revolutionizing human nature. I think it's a dangerous concept. I think many idealists who believe that they can create a society which will enhance a new man or a new woman, very dangerous because very often when they fail, they start twisting arms. They start putting pressure. And then the road is short to oppression. And the road is short to, to persecution. This never happened in the kibbutz movement. No oppression, no persecution, but disappointment. Human nature does not change. Not in one or two generations. Mm -hmm. Sie haben, um diesen Neuanfang damals in der Pubertät eigentlich zu besiegeln, auch sich selbst einen neuen Nachnamen gegeben, von Klausner zu Oss, zu Amos Oss. Und Oss bedeutet Kraft, Stärke. Ähm, warum dieser Name? Weil sie stärker sein wollten also, oder weil sie glaubten, sie seien stark? No, I was not strong at all. I was 14 and a half year old. I left my home. I went to live in an unknown place where I knew nobody and nobody knew me. I needed a lot of strength and courage. So I put it in my name. I didn't have it in my heart, so at least I wanted to have it in my name. This was the thing I needed more than anything else when I left home and went to live on a kibbutz. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Und durch den Namen erschafft man auch so etwas wie eine neue Identität. Well, no, no, I don't think the name changed me. It just represented a certain set of priorities in my life. I tried even during my years in the kibbutz, even in my political activity, and certainly in my writing, I tried to be brave in the simple sense of not necessarily conforming with this or that majority, not always try to be popular, not even worry about being very unpopular among my own people. This is the kind of courage in which I believed as a 14-year-old boy and in which I still believe today. Mm -hmm. ja, das ist interessant, dieser Mut auch zu einer pointierten Meinung und dann vielleicht auch mal als Verräter zu gelten in den eigenen Reihen. Das wurde Ihnen ja auch vorgeworfen und Sie haben auch äh, ein Buch dazu geschrieben. Yes. Darüber werden wir noch sprechen, über den yes. Judas. Ähm, davor interessiert mich noch was anderes. Ähm, ich will noch mal zurück zu diesem, zum Konflikt, zum Nahostkonflikt. Und ähm, wir feiern ja jetzt, also Israel feiert diese 70 Jahre Unabhängigkeit, Staatsgründung. Und für die andere Seite, für die Palästinenser, ist das die Nakba, die Katastrophe, wie Sie sagen. 700.000 Palästinenserinnen und Palästinenser mussten fliehen wurden vertrieben, mussten ihr Land verlassen. Die UNO schätzt bis heute 5 Millionen. Ähm, und jemand, der immer auf diese Missstände hingewiesen hat, ist die äh, palästinensische Filmemacherin Anne-Marie Chaser. Und wir haben sie äh, in Haifa getroffen, am Independent Film Festival. Haifa ist anders. Während überall sonst in Israel die Leute getrennt leben oder getrennt leben müssen, ist Haifa noch immer eine gemischte Stadt. Rund 10 Prozent der Bevölkerung sind Palästinenser mit israelischem Pass. Einmal im Jahr organisieren Kulturschaffende das Haifa Independent Film Festival, das diesmal mit einem einheimischen Spielfilm eröffnet wird. Gezeigt wird Anne-Marie Jessels neuer Film Wajib. Mehrfach ausgezeichnet an den Festivals von Dubai, Mar del Plata und letzten Sommer auch in Locarno. Gedreht wurde der Film in Nazareth. Die Palästinenser in Nazareth haben israelische Citizenship. Aber sie sind third class citizens. Sie bekommen nicht die gleichen Rechte. Sie haben nicht die gleichen more than 50 laws, which like official Israeli laws, which discriminate against them. 
which tells them even who they can marry and who they can't marry. Somebody from Nazareth cannot legally, legally marry somebody from Bethlehem. Two Palestinians cannot legally marry each other. Somebody from Nazareth cannot go to Gaza, cannot live legally in Ramallah. I mean, there's all kinds of rules that they have to, to play by, which is all about keeping Palestinians separate from each other. The whole idea of it is to tell Palestinians, you are not Palestinian, you are an Israeli citizen, you are a West Banker, you are a Gazan, you are a Jerusalemite, we all have ID cards with different colors and different numbers. I mean, it's all part of an, a system of, of apartheid and, and separation. Anne-Marie Jasser lebt heute in Haifa, in Israel. Das kann sie nur, weil sie einen US-amerikanischen Pass besitzt. Aufgewachsen ist sie in Bethlehem, wo ihre Eltern noch immer leben. Hinter der berühmt-berüchtigten Mauer, die Israel von Palästina, Jerusalem von Bethlehem trennt. I've known the occupation since I was born and I have parents who didn't push politics on me. They never spoke about politics. Um, but we saw what was happening. We had to go through the checkpoints, we had to be stopped at the border, we had to be strip searched. Like, I understood without my parents ever saying anything that we were different than other people, um, that we were treated differently. Um, I used to sit on, the, on our front uh, porch of the house in, in Bethlehem, the, the, the stairs in the front, and, and every, every seven minutes a uh, military jeep would go by. And we would count the jeeps, and we were the jeeps. You couldn't gather when, when I was younger, there, it was illegal by Israeli law that more than 10, peop 10 people to gather together. Um, so when we used to have family lunches or dinners, people would leave two or three at a time. We wouldn't like all walk back to my grandmother's house, for example. The solution is very simple. One city, one city, one state for all people. Who cares? You cannot. You cannot separate human beings from each other. I don't care if you're Muslim, Jewish, Christian, Buddhist, atheist, what you eat for breakfast, it's none of my business, it's none of a state's business. These things are nobody's business, it's a private matter. Palestine was that. Palestine was a multi-ethnic, multi-religious place. Palestine my father was born in, because he was born before 48, was that. Muslims, Jews, and Christians lived in Palestine. Today, Israel is This is a Jewish state. You have rights if you're Jewish. And if you are not Jewish, you are Christian or you're a Muslim, goodbye or you, you live as a slave. That's the reality of, of life here. Um, and that's not feasible for the future. Ja, Anne-Marie Jesse spricht von einem System der Apartheid, von Sklaverei sogar. Also wird sehr harte Worte. Und sie fordert nicht zwei Staaten, sondern einen einzigen. Können Sie diese Perspektive verstehen, nachvollziehen? Oh, understand, yes, agree, no. Because I don't think there is any point in taking, let's say, the Germans in 1945 and the Polish people immediately after World War II and say, let's make the two of you one nation. Yellow buses, integration, why Poland, why Germany, become one nation right away. Of course, this would have been an insane idea. Too much anger, bad blood, frustration, lack of trust. Step one between Israelis and Palestinians, ought to be a peaceful division of the country, two homelands. So I understand the one state ideal. In a way, I am even more radical than, uh, than this artist. I believe in a no state world. Am Ende, no dann, national yeah. state at all at the end. But as long as every nation, whether this nation is called Switzerland or whether this nation is called uh, uh, Iraq, Every nation have bars on their windows and locks on their doors. The Jewish people needs to have the same. We tried to live without it for thousands of years. We were the only one who had no land of our own, no bars on our windows, no locks on our doors, no army, no weapons. This ended tragically for the Jews. In some places, some of the audience clapped, bravo. Many places they threw rotten eggs and in even more places they slaughtered the actor. 
we have given a one-person show of existence without the state. It didn't work. So next time, we will join the party after the others. We are not going to be the first, we Israeli Jews, we are not going to be the first ones in the neighborhood to uh, wave down our defenses and say, let's make love, not war. We wait for others. We will join the party. We will not start it for a change because we started the party for thousands of years and no one joined. Yes, I believe that as long as every nation has a homeland, the Jews need one as well. When I say a homeland, it doesn't mean exclusively Jewish. It doesn't mean no minorities. It doesn't mean no equal human rights, just the contrary. Equal rights for minorities, but I mean one slice of territory, part of historical Palestine, part of the land where the Jewish people for a change has the right to be a majority and not a minority. Mm -hmm. Aber Sie sprechen auch diese Gleichberechtigung an, die es braucht und die noch nicht hergestellt ist zu diesem Zeitpunkt, wenn ich Sie richtig verstehe. Well, I have been struggling for many years for the right of the Palestinian people to have their own homeland, nation state in Palestine, and for Palestinians to have the choice between living as part of the Palestinian majority in the state of Palestine or as a part of the Palestinian minority in the state of Israel. This is a decent choice which I offer to my Palestinian counterparts. There will be two homelands. You can live in your own national homeland if this is what you prefer, or you can live in a nearby country as a full-scale citizen, but your national urges will be fulfilled in your own national homeland. Und was machen Sie mit den ganzen palästinensischen Flüchtlingen? Was machen Sie mit den israelischen Siedlungen? Müssen die alle wieder umziehen? Das ist ja also wie das yes. viele praktische yes. Probleme stellen sich. Many practical problems, but believe me, these are life problems, not death problems. Losing home is a terrible tragedy, but it's nothing like losing life. I would lose my home a million times rather than lose one of my children. Lost homes should be replaced by new homes. Lost jobs should be replaced by new jobs. This should be a project of the Arab world, the international community and Israel. Providing the Palestinian refugees with homes and jobs. As for the Israeli settlers on the West Bank, Some of them will have to go back home to Israel because they happen to sit on privately owned Arab land. Others may be allowed to stay as citizens or permanent residents in the future state of Palestine, but not as masters, as citizens or as residents, not as masters. This is complicated, but not undoable. Believe me, all of this is a million times easier than conducting a war. Much easier. Because this will be a painful solution, but no one will die. Lassen Sie uns jetzt ähm, im letzten Teil des Gesprächs noch ein bisschen über Ihre Literatur sprechen. Ein Buch habe ich schon erwähnt, ähm, das große Standardwerk, eine Geschichte von Liebe und Finsternis. Ähm, aber 2015 erschien auf Deutsch dieses Buch hier, Judas. Ja. Und ähm, Sie sagen, diese biblische Figur des Judas, diese Geschichte, sei so etwas wie das Tschernobyl, das Antisemitismus und der Supergau für die Juden. Können Sie das erläutern? Yes, but first let me make it very clear that the novel Judas is not a manifesto about Jews or anti-Semitism or Christianity. It is a novel. It is a story about <coughs> three very different individuals who in the beginning of the novel are total strangers, even potential enemies, and in the end of the story they almost love one another. They become like a family. This is the core of the novel. In the background, there are questions of treason and loyalty, love and betrayal. 
including the biblical figure of Judas, who is conceived in Christian tradition as the archetypal criminal, the diabolical uh, uh, traitor. And in many Christian circles, also identified with the untrustworthy Jew. Smart, clever, loving money, ready to sell everyone, even his master and his God, for 30 pieces of silver. This, my protagonist here, defines as the Chernobyl of Christian antisemitism. In the novel, there is a totally different idea of Judas. Judas is presented in this novel as, as someone who believes in Jesus even more than Jesus believes in himself. He believes that he has to provide a crucifixion for Jesus in order to open the eyes of the whole world to see the light. In other words, crucifixion and then redemption. Crucifixion, the road to the kingdom of heaven now. So Judas in this novel, he's not guilty of treason, he's guilty of fanaticism. He wants redemption now, complete redemption. And like many fanatics, he sacrifices his beloved teacher, master, God, Jesus Christ, not because he wants the money, but because he wants instant salvation. Mm -hmm. Und man kann sich vorstellen, wenn diese alternative Deutung, diese alternative Interpretation, die ein Protagonist in ihrem Buch vorschlägt, wenn sich die durchgesetzt hätte, mm -hmm. dann hätte die Welt wohl ziemlich anders ausgesehen, vermutlich. Und wollen Sie damit auch sagen oder zeigen, wie wichtig, wie weltverändernd eine Deutung, eine Interpretation sein kann? Well, I don't know if interpretations can change the world. I cannot prove it. But I presented this interpretation in ways of seduction. I want to try to seduce people into seeing things differently totally differently than what they were told when they were little children or what they were taught at school. Try to view the same story through a different perspective. I encourage my reader to be a little detective and ask herself or himself, maybe there is a better explanation to the motives of this diabolical Judas. Maybe I will even bring my reader to ask himself or herself some questions about themselves not just about the Bible, not just about Jerusalem, not just about the crucifixion or the most famous kiss in history, but about themselves. Mm. Ja, letztlich sind Ihre Bücher, das sagen Sie, immer auch Spiegel. Es geht letztlich um die Leserin, um den Leser selbst und um Auseinandersetzung. Und Sie sagen, das ist auch etwas, das die jüdische Kultur ganz zentral prägt, diese Debatten. Kultur, dieser Streit um Interpretation, um Deutungen von Deutungen, seine Bücherkultur, sagen Sie auch. Das fand ich spannend. Was ist denn für Sie wirklich das Herz des, der jüdischen Kultur? Können Sie das sagen? Well, if I have to put it in a nutshell, I would say that ours is a civilization of doubt and argument. Ask difficult questions. Never take anything for granted. It's not for nothing that the Jews never had a Pope, nor could they have a Pope. If anyone ever calls himself or maybe herself the Pope of the Jews, every Jew will approach this Pope and say, listen to me five minutes, I will tell you once and for all, what is it that God really wants of us? I know better. It is a certain anarchistic gene, spiritually anarchistic, which I think accompanies the Jews for thousands of years. No wonder that many, many great Jews in history Abraham and Moses and Jesus, Freud and Kafka and Spinoza and Karl Marx and Einstein. They have one thing in common in their biographies, a teenage rebellion against a very powerful father figure. I think this to some extent, not, it's not a comprehensive explanation, but this is the secret of the stubborn longevity of the Jewish civilization, asking questions. Never take anything for granted. When I was a little boy, I asked my father, why is it that we Jewish people always answer a question with a question? And my father said, why not? <laughs> Sehr gut. Dieses, dieses Zweifelnde, dieses Anarchistische, dieses Rebellische, sagen Sie, es gibt aber noch äh, in Ihrem neuen Buch, schreiben Sie, es gibt eine bestimmte 
Form von Sensibilität, vielleicht auch eine Mentalität. Ja. Ähm, und da fehlt der Ausdruck eine fröhliche Melancholie. Das ist das, was viele jüdische Menschen teilen miteinander. Ja. Was ist das, dieses Paradoxon einer yes. fröhlichen yes. Melancholie? Was meinen Sie damit? Well, happy melancholy is what you find in the art of many Jewish artists, whether they are musicians or comedians like Woody Allen or writers like Kafka. The idea that comedy and tragedy are not different planets. They are just different perspectives on the same reality. The idea that joy and sadness are not an either or condition. They can be mixed. And the mixture can become very creative, very enriching, very, uh, very first-rate nutrition for the soul. The mixture of melancholy and joy and insecurity, optimism and pessimism, sensitivity about the sufferings of others and at the same time certain self-righteousness. This strange mixture, strange combination, It doesn't provide for an easy everyday life in, in Jewish society, but I find it exciting and I like it. I like it even at times when I find it hard to survive, hard to stand it, I still like it. Und Sie sagen, derzeit im Moment debattiert man, diskutiert man leider nur noch über Grenzen und Grenzziehungen und Landflächen, aber nicht mehr, wer wir die Israel, die Juden eigentlich sein möchten. Das fand ich spannend. Von welchem Israel träumen denn Sie? Oder was möchten Sie? Welche, welche, welchen, welchen Dialog wünschen Sie sich? Denn? Oh, I will answer this question immediately, but bear in mind that you never get two Israelis to agree with each other on which Israel we want. Hard to get one Israeli to agree with herself or himself. <laughs> everyone is ambivalent. Everyone has a divided mind and soul. I would like, one, peace with the neighbors, B, a pluralistic society, deeply divided intellectually and yet completely nonviolent. I would like this country to be an open air seminary. A, 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 a if you wish, a nation of nine million citizens, Jews and Arabs, Nine million prime ministers, nine million prophets and messiahs. I like it. Israel, if you promise to take the following with a smile, I would say Israel is not a country, it's not a nation, it's a fiery collection of arguments. Herr Oss, vielen herzlichen Dank für dieses schöne Gespräch. Thank you. Das war's. Ja. Very good. Thank you. Thank you.